When I was young, I would take a month-long trip every summer to my grandfather's house in Pine Cove. He had inherited the house when he was 18 and lived there ever since. I loved my grandfather and was always thrilled to visit. I'd look forward to it the entire last month of school and think about the cool breezes from the sea and the occasional trip to the dock for arcade machines and ice cream. My grandfather was a gregarious man and would talk the ear off of anyone. However, that didn't stop him from keeping to himself. He would spend an entire week in his office, at the library, and at the town hall locked in with documents or books of some kind. He'd venture out for food once in a while or play with me for a bit. But largely, I was left to my own devices. I had no complaints. The freedom offered to me was amazing, and something I never got from my parents at home. Strong storms occasionally rolled into Pine Cove in the summer, bringing winds, rain, and the occasional lightning flash with the intense crack of thunder. On one such night, when the rain produced a constant hum as it enveloped the house, a bright flash and sharp bang were followed by the loss of all power to the house. We were left in utter darkness. I was reading in my bed when it happened. I felt trapped in my room. The darkness smothered me. Despite being too old for nightlights, I could still only think of boogeymen and other sinister things that might live in the darkness. Every hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I darted out of the room. Despite being pitch black, I flew down the stairs and headed towards my grandfather's office. Honestly, I was lucky I didn't fall or something, but I knew those stairs well enough to make it down in one piece. I sprinted to the end of the hallway, where my grandfather was hunkered down and threw open the door. My grandfather sat at his desk, a fire burning in the small fireplace, casting flickers of light in the room like stretched fingers. A single candle burned on his desk and illuminated his face. Are you scared of the dark, Oliver? He asked. No, something just felt weird. I replied, relieved to be in the office and not back in that room. I see. Being scared of the dark is foolish. But if you sent something here during the storm, then you are right to be worried. What do you mean, Granddaddy? You're 13 now. Old enough to hear this, I think. And you're my favorite grandson, after all. I'm your only grandson, I said. My grandfather smirked. Yes, my only grandson. But that's not the only reason I have you here every summer. You're much like me when I was a boy, only a little smarter. You're very observant. That's why I know you are the one that will carry on my work here one day. He now looked very serious, the playfulness gone from his face. It is very important, but few know enough to do anything. What exactly do you do in here and at the library all day, Granddaddy? I asked for the first time in my life. He took a deep breath and smiled. Well, now, I suppose I should tell you how it all started first, eh? Has anyone ever told you about your great-great-grandmother? Not much, really. Mom only told me that she died when you were young. She's right, Oliver. At least, that's what I assume happened to her. You see, like you do now, I used to visit my grandmother in this very house every year. She was a wonderful woman and fully independent, but she did have a bit of trouble keeping the place up after my grandfather died. So, every time I came, I would help her fix up the place a bit. One afternoon... I was attempting to repair an old bookshelf when I noticed it getting quite dark outside. Dark clouds started moving towards the town early that morning, so it was no surprise when they finally made it. We were in for a major storm. Nevertheless, my grandmother came in and kissed me on my forehead. She was off to the store to stock up before the storm. I didn't think anything of it at the time. She normally made the entire trip in less than an hour. I was finally getting to the end of my repair work when the sky opened and rain splattered against the roof. As you know, the sound of rain in this house is deafening. I assume it has something to do with the acoustics, but I've come to enjoy it after all these years. It had only been about 30 minutes since Grandmother had left, and I hoped she would hurry back soon. Only then did I hear the first crack of thunder. I left the office and moved into the living room to wait for her, checking outside once or twice. An hour passed, then two hours. The storm was unrelenting, and my grandmother still hadn't returned. But then, I was getting quite worried. 
My main source of comfort was the thought that she decided to just stay in town somewhere to keep out of the storm. But if that was the case, why had she not phoned to say she was okay? Maybe the phones were down, I thought, and rushed over to the one house phone. No dial tone. I assumed that she tried to phone me and could not reach the old house. So I decided to wait there for the storm to stop and my grandmother to return. A few more hours passed. The storm was still going, but not as violently as before. Still no sign of my grandmother. Phones were still down. I was panicked and didn't know what to do. We had no neighbors close by, and I had no practical way to get to town in the storm. As the hour grew later and later, I began to pace about the house and periodically check outside. Where could she be? I muttered to myself countless times. Despite hours of rain, thunder, lightning, and wind, the storm refused to abate. The sound of the rain upon the house remained so deafening that I could barely think straight. All I could do was worry and fret about my grandmother. Around ten o'clock, I could take no more and ventured outside on foot. It was a silly idea to start with, but the idea was proved even sillier when I found the dirt road to the country house completely impassable, especially on foot. With no options available to me, I returned to the old house. The clock ticked on, and at some points I dozed off. A terrible crashing sound awoke me. I suspected that the sound came from the kitchen, but I was not enthusiastic to investigate the cause. Slowly I crept towards the kitchen door. The power was still out and would remain so until morning. I searched around and finally found a flashlight to aid me. Once I reached the kitchen door, I stood very still and listened. Mostly I just heard rainfall that had perhaps begun to ease, but above it was a high-pitched wheezing sound that resembled someone snoring. Though I wanted to remain at the kitchen's precipice indefinitely, I summoned up all my courage and opened the door. What awaited me was the remains of a broken window. At first, I just assumed some tree branch had fallen and busted the kitchen window. Then I saw that the bits of broken glass continued over to my grandmother's root cellar, where she kept various canned goods, meats, and other things that preferred a cold, dark place to remain edible. In addition to the pieces of broken glass was a vicious, dark red liquid like a very thick blood. I had not seen anything quite like it before. Like they say, curiosity killed the cat. So despite my better judgment, I followed the trail of broken glass and blood to the door of the root cellar. The door was wide open, but nothing was visible past the door frame. I shined my flashlight down the stairs. Still, nothing appeared to me, even though the flashlight illuminated most of the staircase. Slowly I descended the stairs, becoming aware of every sound and every slight movement in my peripheral vision. When I reached the bottom, I shined my flashlight around the room. To my amazement, I saw the back of my grandmother, who was facing a large salted pork she had hanging in the corner of the room. Once I focused the light, it became obvious that she wasn't just facing the ham, but devouring it. Grandmother? I cried out in surprise and revulsion. She turned around with only a slight hesitation. Jagged cuts covered her arms and face and the thick blood I had seen all over the kitchen floor oozed from the wounds. Despite how bizarre everything was, I still wanted to help my grandmother out of instinct. I told her we must treat her wounds. She stared at me blankly. I had heard of sundown syndrome before in older people, but my grandmother had never shown any symptoms. I grew beyond worried and became very unsettled by the whole situation. Then she took a slow, deliberate step toward me, and after a moment, yet another, she inched her way over to me. For a second, I thought maybe she was coming to her senses, so I started to calm down. She stretched out her hands towards my face, her own keeping a blank expression. All at once, she grabbed my neck with the strength of a large man and made the horrible noise I had heard from the other side of the kitchen door. The flashlight I was holding fell with a hard thump, but the light never went out and illuminated the bottom of the stairs. I struggled to free myself from its grip. I knew that this was not my grandmother. It was something else. So I stomped on its feet and dug my fingers into its flesh. The skin just peeled off its arms where I dug in, oozing even more of the thick blood. I pushed my fingers all the way through its arms, and they made a grotesque, popping noise as they burst through the opposite side. The thing's grip loosened, 
I pushed off its arms with as much force as I could muster and bound towards the foot of the stairs. It hesitated for a moment as if surprised but begun to move after me at a speed that looked faster than its body was accustomed. Bits of flesh fell off of its drooping body as it struggled towards the stairs. I made it to them quite quickly and bounded up. The thing lunged itself at me as I ascended, ultimately biting into my leg with all its might. I fell onto the stairs with a dull, woody thud. I knew that no matter what, I did not want to be dragged back into that dark room. I kicked it as hard as I could with my free leg. One of my kicks landed squarely between the eyes. This forced its head right back, and with a fierce snap, the thing was forced to let go. It tumbled back down to the bottom of the stairs. I took the chance to escape. I ascended the stairs again and then ran out the door. I slammed the door shut behind me and pushed the heavy table against it. I heard the strange snoring, hissing noise for hours afterwards. It sounded as if it were in great pain. I hoped, even prayed that it might die soon. At some point, I managed to sleep again. In the morning, there was still no sign of my actual grandmother. The thing that had somehow become her ceased to make any more noise. I took the opportunity to clean the kitchen and repair the window. By noon, I was able to gather the courage to return to the root cellar. All that remained of the creature was a copious amount of that thick blood that had been smeared over the kitchen, and a skeletal frame left where it had fallen from the stairs. I looked over the skeleton just out of curiosity. It looked human enough, but there were some features that definitely stood out. The jaw was like no human I had ever seen. The forehead was not quite as pronounced as normal, and several other bones bore a similar disparity. I dare say a doctor could have found much more abnormalities than I, but I did the best I could. Just a few hours later, even the bones disintegrated. I cleaned up anything that was left, and later reported my grandmother missing to the local police. Did they ever find her granddaddy? I asked. No, Oliver, they never did. No one had even seen her in town that day. They did, however, find her car in a swamp off the road on the way into town. They assumed she might have drowned and fallen to the bottom, or perhaps escaped from the car then got lost in the woods. Maybe even she was killed by wolves. All of the explanations are tragic, but what I know came back was the worst one of them all. I've not told a soul until just now. It is a lot to take in, I know. My grandfather looked lost in thought when his story ended. I waited a moment and decided to re-ask the question that prompted it in the first place. So, Granddaddy, is that the reason you spend so much time doing research? He shifted in his seat. Well, let's just say my research concerns other strange events in this town, even some that occurred in this house and on the land around it. I'll tell you more details when you get older, perhaps even a bit next summer. I maintained weekly communication with my grandfather throughout high school, but the visits were less and less frequent. No more month-long trips in the summer every year. I last made it up to see him about a year ago. Aside from the story he told me five years ago, he never did get around to telling me more about his research. My grandfather died last week. Shortly before he died... I received an email from him. He attached a few photos and said that he would like to see me soon if possible, that he had found something that finally validated all his years of research. My mom and I were basically all the family grandfather had, so the lawyer told us everything about his estate over the phone. My grandfather had stipulated that he be cremated as soon as possible after he was deceased, and this had already been done. All that was left was to retrieve the ashes. The lawyer then said what I had been waiting to hear. The house and everything in it was left to me. Now, I'm going back to Pine Cove. I need to know what my grandfather discovered before he died. <laughs>